May God bless you, brothers and sisters. What a pleasure, what a privilege to be inside your homes during this time that the Lord has us blessed, very blessed, because he is working with our hearts, a time of testing, a time of tribulation, a time of anguish, with a purpose in the plans of God. And we are going to see a little bit about this in the second book of Samuel, in chapter 24, we are going to read only verse 1 and verse 10. And the word says, Again the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go, number Israel and Judah. And verse 10, And David's heart condemned him after he had numbered the people. So David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now, I pray, O Lord, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. Through the scripture in the Old Testament, we find four censuses conducted from God, by God, and another census that we just read about conducted by David. But we are going to see something, and we're going to see the reason for the censuses, and we are going into the book of Numbers, verses 1 through 3, and it says that the Lord spoke to Moses in the tabernacle of the meeting, and it says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tabernacle of the meeting on the first day of the second month in the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Take a census of all the congregation of the children by their families, by their fathers' houses, according to the number of names every male individually from 20 years old and above all who are able to go to war in Israel. And we're going to see how Israel, when they were delivered from Egypt, after they crossed the Red Sea, the people encamp at the foot of Sinai. And there in Sinai, camping, free, they had come out of slavery, they received the law of God, and they also received the system of worship. And the government or the organization of a government was formed. This government was theocratic. In other words, the Lord God, Jehovah God, who had taken them as his people, not only would be their God, and they would be his children, the children of Israel, but also the Lord Jehovah God would also be their governor. And that people was going to direct themselves according to the laws of their God. Therefore, the desert to where God took them, that's where they go to, taken by God, and it is to transform people with hearts of slaves into people with hearts of the promised land. Remember that they had been slaves under the whip of Pharaoh and they were obligated to forced labor. And when they came out of Egypt, they believed because one believes. We always have good ideas and we have good plans for our own selves. And so they supposed and they believed that they were not going to have to be subject to obey orders any longer. And that the freedom for them meant to escape from authority. That is the concept and that is what they created in their hearts. And so one year has passed. And they had been for one year at the foot of Sinai in camping. And after being for 400 years in slavery, generation after generation, suffering under the yoke of Pharaoh, now 
Podemos decir, como we dice, can say, inglés, de camping. like we can say in English, camping. They're Está camping out. They are rested. And they suppose, they say, well, this is nice. This is a beautiful time. This is a beautiful time to be next to the sea. Eating. Uh, the Lord fed them. They were hungry. The Lord fed them and gave them water when they were thirsty. They didn't feel the heat. There was a sh uh, cloud that covered them. They were not cold uh, because there was fire that maintained them at a good temperature and they were comfortable. And they supposed that that freedom was going to be an escape so that they would not be submitted to any authority. But in that year that they were at the foot of the Sinai, they were taught that they had to submit themselves to the law of God, submit themselves to his direction, to his government, submit themselves completely to the guidance to arrive, to be able to possess the promised land. And so this resulted in very bothersome to them. They became unhappy, complaining, murmurers. And this was the result of the lack of trust in God and the lack of submission to the government and to the laws of God. And we already read the first, the first census. Okay, so the first census is not developed in the book of Numbers. So the first two censuses that God conducted through Moses and Aaron were in the book of Exodus, chapter 30, verse 11 through 16. And this census was in order to... Uh, reunite the offering to build up the tabernacle. The second census was in Exodus, again, through Moses, is to organize the military service, to know how many men would be available to go to war. But these two censuses that the book of Numbers registers for us from 1 to 3 is for the preparation to begin the march. And so the time of camping is over. The time is over where they heard the law of God. And this was not an act that was forced on them. There was not an obligatory or, or dictatorship from God. But it was Moses that went up to Sinai and God dictated the law. And he went up with 70 men. But those men stayed. In other words, they didn't go up to the presence of God. Only Moses did. And God gave them the laws. Moses, when he comes down, he reads them to the people. And the people say, yes, we are going to obey. The people made a covenant with God and God made a covenant with the people. And so a covenant is an agreement between two. God said, I will take you as a holy nation. I will take you as my people. And these are the laws. And they had to be in agreement. Or they had the option to reject them. But they are there in camping. And they see that it's going well for them. They don't have to work. There is no test. They are restful. And they said, yes, we are going to obey in all things. Yes, we are going to obey. And so Moses goes up again to Sinai to receive the tablets of the law. The law written by the finger of God. And so what, what God, what Moses was shown was the law of God written by the hand of Moses. So here in this book of Numbers, we see that this is the beginning and the initiation of the march through the wilderness, through the desert. So that this people, the covenant had been sprinkled with blood, the blood of animals. And now the process begins for Israel to become 
legitimate children of God. To have Jehovah God as their king, as their governor. Now the process begins to initiate the walk, the journey through the desert where it will be the preparation of the people to enter, to possess the promised land. A preparation, I repeat to you, of people with hearts of slaves being transformed in the desert into people with hearts of the promised land. A very, very drastic change. Big contrast. And the second census, and this is in order to begin the journey, the march, and the journey which lasted 38 years in the desert. After 38 years, in chapter 26 of Numbers, we are going to see what happened with this generation that came out of Egypt. In chapter 26, verse 1, a census takes place again and this census is for a new generation and afterward we will see why it's for a new generation so verse 26 says and it came to pass after the plague that the Lord spoke to Moses and Eleazar the son of Aaron the priest saying Take a census of all the congregation of the children of Israel from 20 years old and above by their father's houses, all who are able to go to war in Israel. A new census. The first one was to begin the march for the process of preparation of a people with a heart of slaves to a people with a heart of the promised land, a transformation, a process. Now it is a new generation. What happened with the other generation? We see here that there is a census for a new generation since 38 years have passed. And the people who had come out of Egypt was punished in the desert. They didn't pass the test. The desert was a period of preparation, of testing, but their unbelief and their complaining heart, their murmuring heart, had not been regenerated. They had left out of Egypt, but their heart was still in Egypt. And we're going to see what the Apostle Paul says over there in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 about these people that came out of Egypt and that God took as his people and God took him as his children and he was their governor, their leader through Moses. God led them. Moreover, verse 1, Brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased. For their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. A whole, a whole people, all of the multitude that came out of Egypt, all of that generation, God was not pleased with them. A people who after they came out of Egypt and they were counted, numbered in order to be trained for war. They were left prostrated in the desert. Instead of being victorious, they were left defeated. And they died in the desert because of the inclination, the sinful inclination of their own hearts, with marks of slavery still inclined towards the world, inclined towards Egypt. And only 
Caleb and Joshua entered. And we are going to see this scripture in Numbers. In chapter 14, we are going to see something that is going to shed more light onto what we are speaking of. So chapter 14, verse 26. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? I have heard the complaints which the children of Israel make against me. Notice, not only they complained about Moses, not only they complained about Aaron, not only they rebelled, against their own leader but they also rebelled against their own God and God says until when am I going to hear this evil multitude who murmurs against me in verse 28 say to them as I live says the Lord just as you have spoken in my hearing so I will do to you in this desert, the carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. All of you who were numbered, according to your entire number, from 20 years old and above, except for Caleb, the son of Jephune, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Reprobated or failed. They failed in the desert. They failed in the place of the process, of the transformation. To possess the promised land, brothers and sisters, is warfare. The trajectory to possess that land that God promised us, the promised land was not the place of rest, as maybe they thought. And as many believe, because they are ill-informed, the crossing of death to life through salvation introduces us into the desert of the process, through the testings, through the battles. And through many, not few, many tribulations. The promised land is a place of conquest. They had to trust that God was with them. To them, it corresponded, just like it corresponds to us, to only trust in God and be obedient to Him. As we can see, the censuses that God ordered had the finality of organizing his people, organize the families, organize the system of worship, organize the military service to fight the good fight and take possession of the promised land. How beautiful what God does. He's a God of order. He organized a people that had been slaves. But that people, though they were free, they were still captive. They still had not released their heart. They still had memory of what they had left behind in Egypt. They still could not understand the plan that God, because of his love, puts us through so that we can have a heart of the promised land, not a heart that murmurs, that complains of people of slavery. The only sense is brothers and sisters that was outside of the will of God we find it in the second book of Samuel which we already read and we are going to focus on the second census I wanted to bring this introduction of the reason for the censuses in the midst of this is the hand of God for 
our direction, our organization. Y ese no es and this, this profit is not for our own glory, it's for our transformation. The one who receives the glory is God. And so the second book of Samuel, chapter 24, we saw David, and it is the only census that was done outside of the will of God. And this census was ordered by King David. And this census points to arrogance and pride. David wanted to see the number of his military power and his material prosperity. And that he stopped trusting in the power of God and in the provision of God. So what happened to David? What happened to the psalmist who had all of his trust in God? Who he did not trust in his stature and his power and in what we had, what he had. He trusted in the mighty giant, Jehovah God. So what happened to him? What happens to David is the same thing that happens to possibly many of us or a few of us. That while there is peace, while everything is going right, we can get to the point of forgetting God. God told Israel, when you are in your land, the land that I am going to give you in possession, do not forget who has brought you up until here. So now David is prospered. He is in peace. He has peace. He lives in the palace. He has a united kingdom. He, it is an established or stable kingdom. The days of the desert have passed. He is comfortable. He's got well-being, which we acquire by the blessing of God. Do you not see this as a familiar scene? What is it that we have seen before this worldly pandemic? What I had seen in the news, I don't know about you, is military parades of people exhibiting, showing off their military power. Countries making a show off of their good functioning of their governments. Other dictators exalted in their power. Others speaking about the good commercial agreements and the low the lowering of unemployment in their governments in these last times these last months before this pandemic what we most heard was about peace and of security of agreements of abundance listen and what about the church what have we heard about the Church of Jesus Christ? Competing one against the other to see who has more members, to see who has mega churches, who are the most famous in the communications, in the media, who has better systems or methods or programs of how to make the membership of the church grow, etc., etc. Totally unfocused of the true reason of the existence of the church of Jesus Christ. What is the purpose of a church? What is the purpose of our own salvation? To reach souls for Christ because of love. Not to have numbers, to have a register or to be famous because we have a mega church but to reach souls for Christ because of love to these souls that do not know salvation the censuses of God were not motive to pride but for the well-being of the people organizing his people training his people for war the system of worship for his glory. But David organizes a census in God's people to exalt himself of his own power and security and prosperity. And we see Joab wanted to stop him 
It says that the king prevailed. David was willing to do this. Though he was warned for him not to do it, they wanted to stop him. But when pride and when exaltation is already in the heart, we don't hear advice any longer. Though God gives you a warning. Now, in the case of Daniel, in the chapter 4 of Daniel, verse 29, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. I'm going to make it short for you. He has a dream and he sees a tree that is cut off and uh, only the trunk remains and Daniel interprets it for him. And he sees that he is confused, he doesn't understand that dream and he comes to Daniel and he says, or Daniel says, look, this is you. Because there's a God that governs over all the kings. And you're going to be, uh, this is known as mental illness. You're going to be eating grass like the beasts of the field. It is craziness. It is mental illness to believe that we can be without God. It is mental illness to believe that it is our power, that it is our strength that makes us. It is God. It is God that has authority over kingdoms. It is God, beloved in Christ. How, how ignorant we look in front of the eyes of God when we exhibit what we don't have. And if we have it, it hasn't come from us. It's come from Him, from God. What mental illness, truly. And Nebuchadnezzar was warned through his dream that Daniel interpreted. But one day, He's there, and uh, he's touring his great Babylon, according to him. He says, oh, the great Babylon that I built. And the voice of heaven is heard. The sentence from God. You are going to eat the plants of the field like the beasts until the time is fulfilled. Seven times to where he came back to his senses, to where he was able to look up. Because when our pride, when that pride enters into the heart of man, it enters into our hearts, we do not look up because we believe that we are higher than the one who is high. But when he was able to see that if the great Babylon in which he exalted himself it was not because of his power, but because of the one who was above him, because of the God who governs, because of the God who puts and takes away kings. And so he came back to his normal state, but he had to repent. He had to David, repent. David, after he had did a sentence on the people, and he... He felt convicted in his heart and he says, oh, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now I pray, oh Lord, take away the iniquity of your servant for I have done very foolishly. So David repents. And so it, his heart was condemned, but the, the damage had already been done because God had already sentenced discipline because this put the whole nation and the whole world in danger. And so the prophet of God comes. Now, when David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet gets David's seer, saying, Go and tell David, thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Choose one of them for yourself, that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and told him, and he said to him, Shall seven years of famine come to you in your land? Or shall you flee three months before your enemies while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days plague in your land? Now consider and see what answer I should set, take back to him who sent me. Wow. Three disi disciplinary acts from God. What do you want, David? This has to be corrected. 
Tú eres el modelo de los reyes. You are the model of the kings. Tú eres el hombre. You are the man that I have said you are according to my heart. You are governing my people. I cannot overlook this act of pride that puts the nation in danger, puts in danger the whole world because you were the model. You are the model. The prophet comes, Gad, and David chose the third option to fall in the hands of the living God and not in the hands of men. David chose the pestilence, the plague, a plague that would come upon Israel. Why did David choose this disciplinary punishment? Because David knew God. David knew the heart of God. He knew that he is merciful and that it hurts him to see the evil. And so the plague came and there was great death. Tremendous death came. Many died. 70,000 men died. What are we living? We have surpassed, United States has surpassed this amount. This morning I saw 80,000 in the whole country. There is a remedy, brothers and sisters. The laboratories, the countries, the nations are looking for a remedy. Everybody wants to find a cure. Logically, we have to see the motivation of the heart. Is it truly that they are interested to stop the death or to exhibit their wisdom that they have the remedy? I don't know. God knows the hearts. And even though David repented, his heart condemned him. There was something else that he had to do. And the scripture says, and when the angel stretched out his hand over Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the destruction and said to the angel who was destroying the people, it is enough. Now restrain your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Arauna, the Jebusite. So where was the angel? Next to the threshing floor of Arauna, the Jebusite. Now look at what David says when he sees the angel willing to destroy Jerusalem. And David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, Surely I have sinned. Now you're praying, right, David? Not only you repent, but it but it actually hurts you now. Now you recognize your sin. With the pain in your heart, I have done wickedly. What did these sheep, but these sheep, what have they done? Let your hand, I pray, be against me and my father's house. So David takes upon himself all of the responsibility. He has sinned. It was not the people who decided he has sinned. Beloved in Christ, David has done what is right now. The only thing that can truly stop this plague is to humble ourselves in the presence of God, recognizing our sins, recognizing our arrogance, our national pride, our patriotic, our economic pride, and the most saddest of all, the religious pride, or however you want to call it. But let's remember that pride is a satanic principle that impedes for the blessing of God to continue to flow. And David raises up an altar 
for the Lord. And beloved in Christ, it is time to raise up an altar. And I know that many homes have already began to raise up that altar. And there is a remedy from God for any virus. The death is going to stop. God forgave David the king and forgave the nation. Now, we are going to see the basis of this forgiveness. Why is it so important that we, that, that the threshing floor of Arauna, the Jebusite, is mentioned. So let's notice that the angel is standing next to the threshing floor of Arauna, the Jebusite. Now let's ask, why is this so important? It is important because it is there in that same spot where the heart of a father who was broken takes his only son and in that time, it was called Mount Moriah to sacrifice his son in obedience to the word of God. God was testing his faith. And why did we say that the tests were for? They are to test our faith, to transform our heart so that we will get a heart, acquire a heart of the promised land. God had promised Abraham and his descendancy the land that flowed with milk and honey. And so there is a broken father here, yes, giving up his only son, the one whom he loved, and he's giving him up in obedience. But this scene was to repeat itself. God did not allow for Abraham's son to die. He stopped. But that scene was to be repeated. Here, in the heart, with an only son would be broken, just as the body of his own son. And it would be surrendered up into the hands of sinners to be killed. That father did not stop the execution. Here, the father surrenders his son for the love toward us to establish a new covenant, the covenant that Israel broke in the desert, the covenant that was sprinkled with blood of animals. Here, there is a new covenant, the covenant that is sprinkled with the blood of Christ. But for that blood to be sprinkled, he had to shed that blood for sinful people like us so that God would establish his laws in our hearts, not so that we would continue according to our way of life or what we believe that is right, but so that we will live according to the laws of the kingdom. And those laws now are to be in our heart and we will be led by the Holy Spirit. The angel is standing in the same spot where Jesus, the Son of God, would die for us. The heart of Jehovah God was shaken when he saw the picture of the cross, a son dying for people with prideful hearts, for an adulterous, a wicked, depraved generation that did not recognize that has not recognized the sacrifice of Christ. Beloved in the Lord, the only thing that can stop death is a humbled heart, confessing our wickedness and repent and look up towards Calvary from where our help comes from. And our help comes through the forgiveness that can, can only be given to us through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Everything we receive in this life, we, leave, we receive from the hand of God. What are we going to be boast of? Let's not give to the Lord what doesn't cost us. David, he says it here in this passage. Arauna wants to give to David what he needs for the sacrifice, but no. What was needed for the sacrifice, God himself provided it for our blessing. He himself provided. David doesn't need anybody to give him anything. He's going to pay for it. We cannot pay because Jesus Christ already prayed, paid. 
but we can do something ourselves. Let's not give anything to the Lord that doesn't cost us. Let's not give to God our leftovers. Let's not give leftovers, beloved, of our time, even in our work for the Lord. Let's not do it with a bad attitude, negligently complaining, murmuring like Israel in the desert. He gave it all up to stop the plague, the destructive plague of sin. He gave it up all and he paid the price to stop death, the sentence of death that was over us. He gave it all up and he paid the highest price because of the love toward us. Can we not make an effort to give of ourselves the best for him? How sad it is to hear hearts of slaves that have not taken advantage of the desert to be transformed that have not taken advantage of the testings of the tribulations of the brokenness in our hearts to bring out out of us that slavery that we had from Egypt beloved in Christ David says I'm not gonna give anything to God that doesn't cost me. We cannot boast. Let's not be negligent. Let's not be boastful, saying we're good, we're prospered. How are you, brother and sister? I am prospered and I am in victory. Yes, we are prospered. But remember that prosperity is not just material. Beloved, the third letter of John. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things, in all things, and be in health just as your soul prospers. It is necessary, brothers and sisters, that just like David, we turn our eyes toward Calvary, the fountain of everything. The fountain of everything that we have received is through Calvary. That is where that fountain that red fountain flowed so that we would be forgiven, we would be blessed, we would be healed, we would be led by his great love, and we would be taken as his own people, not to be at the skirts of Mount Sinai, camping, believing that I can live my life without government without submission to the will of God. God heard the supplication of the earth and the plague ceased in Israel. So it's beautiful what's happening in the midst of all of this pain to see nations, to see cities, to see people on their knees crying out in the mountains, people everywhere crying out for mercy. Church of Jesus Christ, what are we waiting for? Let's come out of our comfort zone. Let's come out of our agendas, out of our projects, busy, running with a bad attitude, doing the work of God because I have so many things pending, because I am prospered, because I need money, because I need a position that is higher, more honorable. I need to be somebody in this life. Be careful. Be careful, David. Be careful. You are trusting in your power. You are trusting in what you have. You are trusting in your possessions. You are trusting in your education. You are trusting in the future. You are trusting in what you can do tomorrow. Be careful, brothers and sisters. Let's come out of that. What does God ask from us? What is it that God asks from us? Raise up an altar. David, raise up an altar. Raise up an altar. Hallelujah. Enter into communion with your God. Trust in Him. Israel was incredulous. They did not believe in God and they were left prostrated in the desert. That complaining, murmuring spirit did not come out of their hearts. 
And so let's not be negligent in the prayers. Let's not wait for a plague to fall to our knees on the streets before the death of a loved one, of a friend, of a relative, of parents, of children. We don't have to fall on our knees before the plague. We need to fall on our knees so that this will cease in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's be obedient, brothers and sisters. Grateful in the testings that God sends to us, in the battles that He allows, in the battles that we have to win because He is with us. He is forming our heart of slaves into people who will have hearts to enter into the promised land, a heart like His. And most of all, beloved in Christ, let's take out of our hearts those arrogant Canaanites, those prideful Canaanites. We have to end with them so that our heart will be willing, so that it will be possessed by Christ only and together enter to possess the heavenly land where we will reign eternally forever with the Lord Jesus. May God help us, brothers and sisters, hopefully, that they find the vaccine against this virus. But I tell you something. The remedy is in recognizing our pride. In recognizing our self-sufficiency and not allowing ourselves to be led by the government of the one whom we took as our Savior to receive goods. But we forget that the desert that we are crossing through before entering into the Promised Land was the process and is the process of our transformation. And it is necessary that through many tribulations we enter into the kingdom of God. Let's straighten up our heart. Let's follow the steps of David as far as repentance. And you will see the glory of God. I will see the glory of God. May God bless you, brothers and sisters. Let's meditate on this. If there was a plague in Israel, it was because of pride. Pride in their governor. If we are in a global pandemic, the root is the same. Pride. Peoples who pretend and pretended to govern ourselves and not being submitted to the government of God. He is the king. He puts and he takes away kings. He is the king of kings and the Lord of Lords. May God bless you. A big hug. What more can I tell you? God bless you. Surrender all to Him.
Jesus.